is, as you know, the Spring 2016 uh, Leadership Studies Guest Speaker Series, and I'm very happy for this event. Uh, it's a special one for me because we're joined by Mr. Jason Scott. Uh, Jason and I served uh, uh, quite a few years together in the military as drill sergeants. Um, in the civilian sector, he's a, um, he's a chemical engineer for Holly Frontier oil refineries, and uh, we, we did a lot of things together in the military career. And uh, I don't take it lightly when I say that he's the most professional non commissioned officer that I have a chance to serve with in uh, 16 years in the military. So there's a great deal of lessons to learn from, uh, from this man. So with that, I'm going to move on here. Thank you very much. As Mr. Castle said, yes, my name is Jason Scott, and I come to you here today to talk about effective leadership. Uh, a big portion of what I want to do today is talk about the melding of my two careers. As Mr. Castle mentioned, in my primary function, I am a chemical engineer for the Holly Frontier Corporation. Uh, we are a group of five refineries headquartered in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have refineries in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I work. Uh, we have El Dorado, Kansas, Woods Cross, Utah, Artesia, New Mexico, and Cheyenne, Wyoming. I form a member of a team there that, uh, as process engineers, we provide technical support to the refinery and help with uh, safety leadership. In my other career, I am in my 14th year of service in the Army Reserve. In my current position, I am the first sergeant of a drill sergeant company in Stillwater, Oklahoma. It's very special to me in this role because that's where I originally served as a private when I joined the military. So now I get to be the leader there. Effective leadership is the topic that I would like to cover today. I'd like to start off with a little bit of a definition. Leadership is a difficult concept to put into a box. However, the Army, I feel like, does a pretty good job. I have a definition here from the Army's ADP 622 that states, leadership is the process of influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. I really like this. You'll note up on the screen I've bolded a few words, purpose, direction, and motivation. I love the way that rolls off the tongue. I love to take that and express that whenever we do something. Whenever my team gets ready to hit a task, at being drill sergeants, I am the leader of the drill sergeant unit, but each member of my team is also a leader, <laughs> responsible for the welfare and training of 55 initial entry soldiers. So I like to remind them every chance I get to take every opportunity to instill purpose, direction, and motivation in your team. An overview of some of the things that we're going to talk about today, I'd like to start with we're going to cover proper personal default settings for yourself as a leader if you want to be the most effective leader possible. We're going to look at the insist assist policy. I'll further define that. We'll talk about instilling pride. This is an incredibly important piece of being an effective leader. We talked that part of the definition of leadership was accomplishing the mission and at the same time improving your organization. Instilling pride in those around you is an important, important cornerstone of how you affect that. <coughs> Lead by example. Very important for any leader. It's a contagious quality that improves your performance as well as those that work alongside you. Soliciting and offering feedback. Very important for improving the organization. Most tasks that you and your group will accomplish you will do more than once. So you want to make sure that you take the opportunity to improve with each successive time that you accomplish your task. Increasing knowledge and empowering. This is the process by which you as a leader grow the subordinate leaders and work for the future of your organization. And finally, we'll close with a summary of some of my own thoughts. When I talk about personal default settings, what I'm looking for is the zero point that you start from. When we come in Monday morning to start a new week, I'm talking about having the posture and confidence that says that you're ready to go. 
I like to remind people to smile. It's important. And when I say that, I don't mean that you need to be positive about everything. Because there will be challenges, and not everything is positive. But when I say your default settings, I'm talking about that zero point. If there is no information, good or bad, well then let's start off being positive. Let's say we're excited to be here, we're excited to do what we're going to do today. And that's how we help drive purpose, direction, and motivation for our team. Be what right looks like. When I joined the Holly Frontier Corporation, a few years into my tenure there, we conducted social styles training. This is something that we brought in, had a leadership consultant work with us. Part of this training was a detailed questionnaire that each individual filled out on yourself, and then a smattering of peers, subordinates, and supervisors filled out the same questionnaire about you. I noticed as I went through the questionnaire, it seemed like every third or fourth question was asking things about your appearance, your posture, the way you hold yourself while you conduct, participate in meetings, conduct discussions. Didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at the time. But when I saw the results, I understood that it speaks to your personality type. And setting off that positive image right from the beginning is an important piece of instilling motivation in those around you. The insist, assist policy. This is very important to me. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background on this that comes from my time as an instructor at the U.S. Army Drill Sergeant Academy. As Mr. Castle mentioned, I've been a drill sergeant myself for 10 years in the Army Reserve. And in 2009, I was granted the opportunity to attend the school once again and this time as an instructor candidate. I became certified as an instructor and I'm very proud of the fact that I served a year during 2010 and 2011 as an instructor at the U.S. Army Drill Sergeant Academy. It was definitely a little bit different feel for me to go from training civilians who are just entering the military to a class that I'm sure you can imagine in 2010 knowing the history of what our Army did 2003 and on, transition to training already accomplished combat veteran non-commissioned officers is a different student pool than the initial entry training soldiers. Well, when I say insist, assist, the first piece of that is insist. You will insist that all members of your organization rise to the standard of performance. You will not lower the bar to anyone. You will help lift your individuals to it. When I was an instructor, one of the first things that we do at the Drill Sergeant Academy it was we bring in our soldiers. And one of the first academically challenging tested events is teaching a series of drill and ceremony movements. This is done in a very prescribed narrative that the Army puts out. We, these are some of our base core movements and it's important that they'd be taught in an effective manner so that you know that the soldier who's learning to be a drill sergeant can teach that effectively where they go on in their career. One of my talented soldiers that came to work for me was Sergeant W. Sergeant W, obviously I know now, he came to the drill sergeant school with the impression that he was going to cruise on through. He was already had in his mind that he was going to be the honor graduate of his class. In order to be the honor graduate, you must achieve a first time pass on all graded events. This is part of the initial briefing. Well, we had a series of tested events within day three of his course. I'll give you a little background. The course in total is 10 weeks long. We're very early on the front end. Sergeant W did well on several of the tested events, but he had one where he did not give an effective presentation. It's a learning process, not usually an issue. I let him know whenever he finished up, I was his evaluator, that he had not passed the third event. Counseled the soldier, let him know what his deficiencies were and what he could do 
to shore that up in the future. Come back tomorrow, we'll get a pass on this. He got very upset right from the get-go. He asked me, he said, so you're telling me that I am no longer authorized, I am no longer in the running for graduation honors when we finish this course. And I realized at that moment what was going on. As I mentioned, it was obvious to me that he had come with the intention of being the top graduate in the class. And within the first 72 hours, we had put a halt to that. His purpose, direction, and motivation was in trouble. It was concerning, but we went on. I explained to him that the purpose of the Drill Sergeant Academy is to teach those to be professional instructors. It's not intended purpose to be a stepping stone for promotion points and accolades later. So that was the spot where I insisted that he must meet the standard. I will not lower the bar to allow him to achieve. He must rise up. So let's talk about the ACIST piece. Same individual, Sergeant W. I recognized that this was a, a loss for him. He didn't like that, but he drove on. I had an opportunity just a couple of weeks later, this same individual, we had moved into the heavy marksmanship portion of our training. It's a very technical piece. We spend every day firing the rifles, working on getting everyone's marksmanship up to par. And I recognized within the first day or two of that block that Sergeant W had a real proficiency for this. He enjoyed marksmanship training. He enjoyed seeking perfection. So one of the things I did a couple of days into the training is I let the whole class know publicly that I was appointing Sergeant W as my assistant instructor. Whenever those soldiers are preparing their classes, whenever they're getting ready to teach their peers about marksmanship training, I advise them you should sit down with Sergeant W the day prior. Tell him what you're going to teach. See if he has any notes for you. Well, I'm here to tell you, he liked that. As I sat there and watched him, I saw him kind of turn in profile beside me. And I told the whole group that I, they should look to him for guidance. And I'm telling you, I could just see kind of an outline of an American flag just kind of flowing behind him. He loved it. He sat up straight and really... I didn't do anything to assist with that. I just let the group know that I thought that was important. I never had another issue with the soldier. He went on to graduate, had a great time as a drill sergeant, and smiled when he finished. No longer worried about the fact that he would not be the honor graduate. He was fulfilled in a different way. Instilling pride. Instilling pride is an important component of helping your organization move forward and dealing with the mental health and happiness of your team. I implore you to speak the language of your organization. And when I say that, I'm talking about mission statements, values that your organization holds dear. You'll often run across those. I'm sure that Fort Hayes State University has a mission statement and values that they hold near and dear to their heart. Sometimes they may sound a little cliche, and you may think that it was just something that somebody sat down in a room and came up with. But what you would find, dig a little deeper into it, is that the leadership of the organization sat down and put a lot of effort into that <coughs> because that is truly what your group believes. In the Army Reserve, we have the Army values. And in my civilian career, the Holly Frontier Corporation, we use a program that we call the Five Pillars. Coming from the Army, I'm very used to acronyms and mnemonic devices. So as soon as my company rolled out our Five Pillars two years ago, I immediately made a mnemonic device for myself so that I could always remember that our Five Pillars are engagement, questioning attitude, integrity and courage, increasing knowledge, and structured approach. I like to use those whenever I have discussions with members of my team about how we're going to solve a problem, 
how we're going to get that we're going to sit down at a table together we're going to talk about the issues that are in front of us and we're going to come up with a plan I like to rope those back in because my organization feels that those are important and I like to speak the language it's part of helping that purpose direction and motivation I'd like to offer another story before I went to work for the refinery I spent 10 years working for a manufacturing company. It was a great job. I really enjoyed it. And we had a shop where we produced air-cooled heat exchangers. Several metal components basically go together to make a piece of oil field equipment. In this manufacturing facility where I'd worked in and out of for 10 years, we had a good, we had a good thing going there. We had a good safety record. We had good profit margins. We stayed busy. Everything was fine. But we did have a lot of turnover. It's part of the nature of that business. You know, uh, one company in town kind of bumps up in workload, so they'll offer 50 cents more an hour, and you see a lot of movement within the group. Okay, it's understood. But shortly after I left, the company decided they wanted to do something about that. And so they went about to do a 5S makeover of their facility. 5S is a program that goes hand in hand with lean manufacturing. And what it's, the heart and soul of it is housekeeping. The mantra that there's a place for everything and everything is in its place. I got a call several months after I'd left that company inviting me to an open house at the facility. So I went. They said, bring your family, bring your kids. Okay. When I arrived there, I saw that they had taken what I'd always remember for 10 years as a dirty, nasty, sweaty manufacturing facility, and they had really done a makeover on the place. They had cleaned up the building. They had gone through all the walking areas and painted thick, nice yellow lines along the floor to tell you where's a work area and where's a walk area. They had moved a lot of the equipment out of the way. They had picnic tables out with checkered tablecloths on the top. They were cooking hamburgers. They had people speaking and giving away door prizes. And the coolest thing I saw was they had members of the workforce there taking friends and family on tours of the facility to, show the, to allow the workers to show their families what they were doing on a daily basis. I couldn't believe it. It was not the same place that I recognized for the 10 years that I had spent there. They had taken the same facility, put a makeover on it, and instilled pride in their people. Lead by example. Never require anyone to attempt any task that you would not do yourself. That sounds easy. I mean, that sounds like bar none, that should be a rule, right? Sometimes it gets lost in the mix. Not intentionally, and I'm not saying that every task that anyone that you lead would do, you have to have done yourself. But you need to be willing to do it, and you need to know that it's done safely. It's important for safety and morale that anyone who is performing a task for you knows that your heart's in it. You would be willing to do that yourself. This is a contagious quality. As you, in a leadership role, instill this in your people, that you are willing to lead by example, you will see they will begin to exhibit the same quality. That trickles down. Once again, when I was an instructor at the Drill Sergeant Academy, I had a soldier here, I'll note as Sergeant O, Sergeant O was a good guy. I liked him. Kind of a little fella. This was uh, circa 2010. He came to the school, or, as I mentioned earlier, already a combat veteran, uh, an experienced non-commissioned officer. But he was also quiet, not an imposing figure. And I remember one evening we were having a ceremony for the group. We were changing phases. It's, very motivational ceremony in which we 
it's a milestone hit. Drill sergeant school is roughly 10 weeks long. This is happening after about the first three weeks. So we're transitioning from the initial period to more student leadership. So we take the group out and the senior drill sergeant leader is out there with me. He's in front of the whole group. I'm in front of my platoon and he says, drill sergeants, prepare your platoons for phase change. Typically, this would mean that I would turn around to my group. We would go through some cadence calling, maybe do some push-ups together, do something, everybody get yelling, motivating, we're going to move on to the next piece. Well, just as I got ready to turn around, I hear this voice behind me answering the question, are you ready to change phase? And this voice behind me yells out, Drill Sergeant, yes we're ready, we were born ready, fit to fight, fit to win, Drill Sergeant. Just as I was here, I, I didn't have time to stop turning around. It surprised me. I, didn't, I had not prepped him to do that. When I turned around, there it is. And I'm sure the look on my face said I was surprised. I said, okay. I guess that answers all my questions. Turned back around to the boss. Released the group. Dismissed him for the evening. Nobody said anything while that was going on, right? So I told him, okay, psh, you're done. Go home. I walk off. Just kind of slowly waited around the corner and watched. And that guy was Sergeant O, the little guy, quiet guy in the formation. He called out and stopped me in my tracks. I'm the boss. He stopped me in my tracks like that. And when I released him to go, everybody in the group was patting him on the back. Said, oh, man, why? Well, you really, you stopped Drill Sergeant Scott right in his tracks right there. I loved it. The whole group, that guy walked taller the whole rest of the time. I don't know that I had anything particular to do with that, but I know that wherever he picked that up, he was following a positive example that he had been shown at some point in his career. And look what that did to the team. They all rallied around him. They all loved it, myself included. I was a big fan. Soliciting and offering feedback. This will be an important piece of what you do. As I mentioned earlier when we looked at the overview, most tasks that you and your team accomplish, you're going to do more than once. So how do you make sure that each time, each successive time, you go through the same type of work? You get better each time. Well, in the Army, we have something we call an after-action review, and I love that. It's a series, it's a question and answer, an open dialogue that the leader and the team go through every time, every time right after an event happens, while it's still fresh in everyone's mind, to make sure that we capture the answers to the questions you see on the screen. Now, that being said, health and safety comes first. If you're about to embark on a task, or anyone that you work with is about to embark on a task, and you have a concern for health and or safety, by all means, stop right there. Any organization is going to authorize you and reward you for stopping a, a health and safety concern at any point in the process. However, my advice to you, if you are given a plan for how to execute something and your team gets ready to go. If there is not a health and safety concern and you see a better way to work through whatever work you're going to do, the best time for you to offer and solicit the feedback is after you've completed the task the first time. What I'm saying there is, I hear folks say all the time, well, I like to work smarter, not harder. Okay, I'm all for that. But if you're telling me that before we do the task for the first time, I'm thinking that what you really mean is you like to delay the working because you want to talk about a different way to do it. You want to throw a wrench in the deal. So that's why I say the feedback from you 
and your team carries the most weight with those making the decisions, evaluating how we go about conducting our business, if you'll gather and offer that feedback, compile it after you've finished the first time, you say, okay, I did it your way once. Here's what I learned. Here's how I think we can get better in the future. Now, it took me a long time to figure that out. I used to be the work smarter, not harder guy. I wanted, boy, if you told me how we want to do something, I had six or seven ways to improve that before I ever started taking any action. But I have found through watching that feedback fall on deaf ears, because we're still sitting at the initial timeline, that offering it after the first run, after the task is completed successfully, and say, I have these keys for how we can do better. I like that. So the questions that we look at, what do you think? Absolutely, you need to make sure when you're a leader, you've completed the task. As I mentioned, this is, while it's still fresh in everyone's mind, we want to make sure we jump in there and get the feedback from the entire group. Everyone's opinion is important. Another key, write down what they say. You won't remember it. Have that tactile response right there. Your pad, your pen in front of you. Take the notes. Show them your subordinates and maybe your peers, maybe even your supervisors. Show them that you're interested in their input. Take the notes. Write it down. The obvious question for the review of what we do, gathering this feedback, is what could we have done differently? The whole group, what's your input? What do you, what do you see as an opportunity? This is the time for you to get that. And finally, what I think is the most important question, what should we make sure that we keep doing this is something I had to learn through trial and error as well. Your perspective as a leader in an organization is different from those that are on the ground floor, those that may be your subordinates working for you. Sometimes we can get caught, so caught up in improving what we do, improving our processes. You might change, remove, omit their favorite part of the process. That might be their most fulfilling part of the task for them. And if you don't ask them, what do you want to make sure that we keep what we sustain the next time? You might be causing turmoil without even knowing it. From your perspective, you're improving. From their perspective, you might be taking away. So I ask you to remember, in my opinion, that's the most important question. What should we make sure that we keep doing? I've got an example of this that comes from my time with the refining company. I have a process unit that I support with technical support and safety management. One of the things that we do, this particular process makes a product that is in high demand in the summertime and a lower demand in the wintertime. Part of running it all year long means that it gets dirty, just like components of your car that need maintenance, your heat and air system at the house. It gets dirty the more you run it, and you have to take some downtime to clean it. And the way that we clean this particular piece of equipment is most of the time, every spring, in order to ramp up for that summer season, we bring in solvent and we wash the equipment that we use for that process. Before I arrived, at the refinery, we always requested and always used that solvent delivered by rail car. The reason that we did that is because we could have one train car pulled into the refinery with all the solvent that we needed for the action. The downside of that was that it takes two months to order and receive a rail car by the time that you need it. Most of the time, that's too easy. We know two months ahead of time when we're going to do this, conduct this work. No problem. 
However, we had a particular year in 2013 where we didn't have two months' notice, folks. We needed it to happen sooner. We contacted the solvent company. They couldn't make the rail car get there in the time that we needed it. Now, I mentioned that rail car is the preferred method because we only take one delivery. However, we were given the option, we can send you four trucks to get you the same chemical that you need to perform your work. Okay. So I immediately took it to the team. Hey, guys, well, listen, exciting news. We have solved the issue. We can't get the rail car, but we can get four trucks. Every head in the room hung out. Oh, no good. They said, we've always taken it by rail car. I, I don't like this change. I don't, we can't do this. We can't do this. We've never done it this way. Okay. So what we did, we went back to our processes that we have in the refining business. We got the right people in the room together. We sat down. Everybody at the same table. No distractions. And we talked about what do we need to do to make sure that we do this correctly. We have a mantra within our company that states that we will strive to do the right thing the right way every time. Purpose, direction, motivation. How can we get there? This is the task before us. So we sat down, we talked through this. I had an operations personnel that was the coordinator for this effort. And we talked through their concerns. Identified them all. And I had some of these discussions about soliciting and offering feedback on the front end. I said, now I know that it's not plan A to unload four trucks of this material as opposed to one rail car. But that is what we're going to do. So we talked about the fact that we were going to answer these questions when we got finished on the front end. I let him know right away that we were going to have this platform to improve our organization when we finish this up. Whole tone changed right there. Okay, all right. Still looking, still not crazy about this idea. Still wanting to make sure we had laid out several uh, conditions under which we would, we would do this work. And we sat down when we finished. Everything went successfully, no issues. We sat down and we had a formal meeting. And the questions that you see on the screen there, we wrote them out on paper. We typed up all the feedback that we got from the operations team and filed it. Fast forward, next spring comes along. The next spring, we didn't have the same issue that we were pinched by time. But when we went to coordinate that same effort, the next year, the operations team came to the meeting holding a hard copy of the review that we'd had the year before because now their input was we should look at these two methods equally as opposed to just defaulting to the rail car method. The original, the primary, this is the only way that we can do it, that was no more. That was gone. Because now we had evaluated both methods Everyone had had their platform to provide their feedback, give their input. They'd had their voice heard. And now they saw them as equal deals. So what we did, we went in and set ourselves up a nice outline procedure for doing it both ways. And now it's just a flip of the coin which one we do. Increasing knowledge and empowering. Empowering your team. This is the process where I mentioned in the overview that we grow the future leaders. This is the culmination of leading by example, instilling your team with purpose, direction, and motivation. Share your knowledge and experience. My advice to you, do not be concerned <coughs> that giving away any of your knowledge is going to in any way make you less valuable to the organization. In my experience in industry and in the military, 
I have never seen that be the case. Teach every opportunity that you have. Instill the drive to go get it yourself. There's a lot of information out there. There's information that governs how we go about being a student. There's rules, procedures. There's information that governs how we go about being a member of industry, how we go about being a professional instructor. What you want to do is instill the drive. Show your team how to go get that information for themselves. You don't want to be the conduit of guidance. Sure, you help. It's part of that ACIST policy that we talked about. But we want to instill everyone to go find it of their own. Use the processes within your organization to provide checks and balances. I told the story a little earlier about how changes come. The rail car versus the truck deliveries. Changes are a part of everything that we do. You get a comfort level with accomplishing a mission, performing a task in a certain way. Just about the time that you get, set, that you get settled, there'll be a change come down the road. How do we go about handling that? In my civilian career, we operate under process safety management. That's a, an OSHA program that governs industries like refining. That dictates who needs to sit down and make a decision. Typically, you're going to include safety personnel, engineering, and operations all together to come to a common solution. Every organization, that's just an example, every organization has checks and balances like that. They have avenues for providing your input. Make sure that you make use of those. The procedures are set up so that your voice has a way to be heard. Make sure that you take advantage of that. And when you're a leader, encourage those around you to use whether it be whatever vehicle they need to get their input. Make sure that their voice is heard. Encourage them to do that. In summary, I like to talk about competitive edge. This doesn't mean kick somebody when they're down. This doesn't mean win at all costs. When I define competitive edge, is it within a group, there should be a little healthy competition, right? You should enjoy, it, when you're performing highly, you should enjoy the fact that you encourage those around you to perform at that same level or even higher. We talked about insisting that each member of your organization meets the standard of performance. Okay, you insist the standard, but you encourage to exceed the standard. Don't miss an opportunity to tell someone why. And this is one of my favorite, this is a personal thought from me to you. When you're in a leadership position, one of the most powerful things you can do is give a greater picture of the story. Oftentimes, the leader gets to sit in on meetings, make decisions that not the entire team is privy to. You want to take every opportunity to communicate that out as widely as possible. Everyone feels more ownership and more satisfaction in what they're doing if they know more about what's going on. It doesn't matter what the individual piece is in the puzzle. Tell the whole story. Where, we're where we are trying to go as a group. Because remember, leadership is trying to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. The more everyone knows about the larger picture, the more they feel like they can improve the organization. The best way to improve your leadership. My current position in the Army Reserve is the senior enlisted advisor to the commander of Charlie Company, 3rd of the 378th in Stillwater, Oklahoma. As I mentioned earlier, I'm very proud to serve in that role, partially because that's the same unit that I came into 
That was my first unit of assignment in the Army. During that time, I have, individ I have personally watched six other people work the job that I currently hold. Those, that job is typically held for a two to three year stint. Here I am, I've seen examples of it six times and now it's my chance to do the job. I'm very excited about that and I feel that it displays the last bullet point I have here. The best way to improve your leadership is to get promoted. I've taken something good and noted some lessons learned about every one of those six individuals that I've seen do that job. I haven't been there continuously. I've gone around, I've done other things, but I've always come back. I feel I'm in the best position to improve that organization, having been a member myself and watched those six people do the job and said, I know what I can do to make this better, and I'm excited to go do it. That brings me to the close of my presentation. I'd like to open up. Are there any questions from the group? Outstanding. Yes? Absolutely, I do. It's, it's a great question, and I really... Uh, I like to tell people all the time that my civilian career likes me because of my military experience. And I do better in the military because of my experience in the civilian career. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the military, senior leadership in the military today is a lot computer driven. It's information awareness, it's ability to gather and distribute information electronically. Well. I can tell you when I went to, back to sergeant school in 2004, we didn't talk about that a whole lot. We were talking about how to shoot our guns that way. We didn't talk as much about information awareness. So yes, I feel like the uh, experiences that I've had in the business world, uh, my experience as an engineer, really helps me there. And then the flip side, there's nothing like being a drill sergeant prepares you and forces you to speak to large groups on a daily basis, all day, every day. And we all know that that's, that's a common obstacle for a lot of folks when they get into the business world because eventually, soon in your tenure, you're going to be ma making presentations to large groups of intimidating people. So yes, that's how I see the two fitting together to help me. Yes? Great question. <laughs> the first piece of becoming a leader, you know, I, uh, I joined the military in 2003. There was a lot going on in 2003. I was, in, I was just finishing college at that point, and I wanted to add that dual piece to my life. I saw the uh, Army Reserve as a way to enrich myself. And so I joined up, and I don't think that I made the decision about becoming a leader right away. It's kind of a natural part of the process. Uh, your natural progression in the military is to become either a non-commissioned officer or a commissioned officer. Non-commissioned officers, heart and soul of their mission is to train and lead soldiers. Well, that happened fairly quickly. The flip side was, I think that what I would like to answer with your question is not when did I become, when did I want to become a leader, but when I made the decision to become an effective leader, a great leader, happened shortly after I uh, earned my drill sergeant status myself. When I first went in the year 2006 to teach 256 civilians to be soldiers, that had a profound impact on me. That was a very hard job. I didn't have the experience that I have now. I was 24 years old myself. At that time, 
You could enlist in the United States military all the way up to 42 years old. And there were several folks older than me in my training class. That was very intimidating for me. But what I found with the feedback that I got about the extra time that I took and making sure that my instruction was effective and that I led by example and seeing that positive feedback made me feel like I wanted to do that job as well as I possibly can. And being an effective leader will take every piece of you, every little drop of your soul. But that being said, it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding to do the job well. Thank you for that. Yes? Great question. Absolutely, I did. You know, I talked about the public speaking. For me, that was a, that was a big issue. You know, I had I'd finished college, engineering school, didn't really prepare me for a lot of that. We had some presentations, but they were mostly in small groups, and they were highly technical. You know, the slides were up there. The boiling point of such and such is here. You can see that on the chart. It was very defined what I needed to say. But a transition to becoming a leader in the military, all of a sudden, it was a lot more free form. The shortest answer to your question is practice. Jumping in there and doing it. And starting with the smaller group. You know, we, we rehashed the thing. I started with doing more teaching about the things that I felt the most confident about. Physical fitness instruction, I felt great about that early on. Uh, marksmanship was a great piece for me. Some of the others, I wasn't so strong in. But as I went on, and as I had that confidence, and as I rehashed this material and practiced teaching it over and over, practiced it for myself, I found that the anxiety began to fade away. Okay. If there are no more questions, I think we're in good shape. I thank you very much for your time and your attention today. I hope that you can take something with you about effective leadership. Okay. Yes, I'm all finished. <laughs>